Welcome to the Engage 416 podcast. Today's guest is a good friend of mine, somebody that I've known for quite some time, Rafael Delgado. I think I said that right. Perfect. It's a little bit of a mouthful for me, but how are you doing, man? <laughs> I haven't seen you in so long. You know what? I've been doing good. I think uh, regarding everything that's been going on, I think everybody came out safely, and I think we're, we're all happy just to you know, be normal again. Yeah, you're talking about the pandemic, eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you, you've been coaching uh, boxing in the Mississauga area, in the Toronto area for quite some time. Mm-hmm. How did the pandemic affect your business, man? Oh, large. Um, I had just uh, opened up my own spot right a couple months before the pandemic hit. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we were open maybe like six months and then boom, like shut down. Mm-hmm. Um, full gym and all of a sudden, yeah, you got shut down your business. Mm-hmm. And we're like, oh God. And um it, luckily for me, it's a small spot. It's not huge. Um, mm-hmm. So I was able to uh, get through it. Um, but, yeah, it, it was tough because I know a lot of businesses didn't make it. I, mm-hmm. I was lucky. I, you know, I'm happy I we're open now. Yeah. Now, were you, were you, did you have negotiated a new contract with the late lease owners? or No. You know, uh, I think a lot of the landlords, they took advantage of the situation mm-hmm. they don't really care whether you make it or not Ugh. yeah so i actually didn't hear much from them mm-hmm. uh we just kind of stayed open uh just kept paying the rent and mm-hmm. uh we hope for the best and uh, that's all we could do with them they they never contacted us once uh, uh, it's too bad yeah <laughs> well on to a better or let's start off the story let's figure yeah. out how you actually and i've never asked you this question i wanted to know um, you know, as a, you you know, I was thinking, hey, we can just get Raf on here as a guest. Let's talk to him. But let's find out. Let's find out where it all started for you with boxing. Oh my. Um, well, I mean, I grew up in the project downtown Toronto, mm-hmm. uh, Spadina and Queen area. I had my family in Regent Park, and I had family in uh, the projects spread right Spadina and Queen. And um, I, you know, I uh, I grew up there playing a lot of sports, mm-hmm. just a lot of sports, and. Um, I believe it or not, <laughs> I was a big fan of the WWE. <laughs> I love it. So I actually had, I was a small kid, I was maybe 120 pounds soaking wet. And mm-hmm. um, I went to a gym, Sully's gym. Okay. Uh, this was the original gym back in the day, um, Ossington and Col- Ossington and Queen area. Okay. Between Dundas and, Col- and uh, Queen. And uh, they said to me, um, what are you doing? I go, oh, I'm going to try out some wrestling um, training. And looked at me, he goes, Jesus, you're going to have to put in about 100 pounds, kid, of muscle. And I'm like, can it be done? <laughs> and he, said, he looked at me, he goes, and this was the owner, um, Sully. He, he said to me, why don't you try boxing instead? Mm-hmm. And I said, I, I've never tried boxing. And we were in a boxing gym uh, just above a garage, so you smell the fumes and everything. I'm thinking to myself, and I'm watching the wrestlers doing their training, and these are huge men. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I was maybe a buck twenty five, you know, soaking wet. And I'm like looking, go like, maybe I'll try some of the boxing, you know. And mm-hmm. um I was still in high school and I um where I lived there was a a gym right next to my house, Newsboys Boxing Gym. And but there was a lot of troublemakers, guys that were not necessarily in the right side and I I didn't want to be associated with them I was trying to avoid a lot of trouble and um, I ended up it's a good 20 minute run to the gym to mm-hmm. Sully's not 20 30 minutes but I said you know what I'll, I'll go down there and I started training there and I think for about two weeks he let me train then he goes hey I need some money from you and I said I'm still in school and I'm trying to get a job and he said tell you what why don't you uh, just clean up the gym for 10 15 minutes and I'll let you train for free and I'm like excellent and that's how it started. I started training, um, and it was one of those things. It was just a old school gym. Mm-hmm. It was almost like a Rocky movie, you know. It was like little old guy watching you train, and you just <laughs> literally on your own kind of thing. And then when the pros were there, I mean, you had some pros like Canadian legends going in there, Eddie Mello, Jimmy Gratson, mm-hmm. like some big names. They would come in once in a while, and you just get like starstruck, and you're like, oh my God, these are the guys, you know, and. Um, you know, I, I did a little bit of, I, did, I had a couple of fights uh, here, and then I had an uncle that lived uh, just over the border, uh, and he would sometimes take me over just to do a couple of sessions here and there, you know, like over in Buffalo, 
sometimes we go a different route, whatever, but I uh, had a couple fights there. Uh, and I, I didn't do a lot of fighting, a lot, a lot of fighting, but mm -hmm. I enjoyed it so much. It's, it's one of my passions, kept me out of trouble, and it just kept me honest, you know, mm -hmm. like the training, the discipline. It was just beautiful. I loved it. Uh, and I was an athlete, so for me, it was just something that, like, oh, man, this is challenging. I love this. This mm -hmm. is what I want to do. And... Um, I think what I love the most is that confidence that it gives you, you know, like you don't have to go out and look for trouble. You just in your in your heart, you know, it's like, okay, I don't have to be a tough guy. Mm -hmm. Like I know what I can do. Yeah. And in the streets, people see you, they're like, okay, this guy looks like he knows what he's doing, let's leave him alone. I was a little guy, but I think that confidence showed. And um, like I said, I think uh, 35 years later, I'm, I still love the sport so much, you know? That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, so you talked about the neighborhood that you were living in. You're saying it's a, it was a kind of a, I guess, cr crime impacted neighborhood. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you were at a, an, an early age. You were able to recognize that there was some nefarious characters within your your neighborhood. And you wanted to stay out. Um, I th I think at that time, um, I'd say in the seventies and eighties, um, that area was pretty rough. Um, I mean, you had officers walking in threes and fours. They couldn't walk alone in there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Atkinson's project was just starting there, so the projects were still pretty rough. Yeah. Um, but it's one of those things where, like, you, when you grow up in the environment, you become the environment. You know, like, a lot of guys turn into drugs, a lot of guys turn into gangs. Um, I I don't know. I just never had the heart for that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I never liked smoking. I never liked drinking. I never liked anything really, like, that was bad for me. Mm -hmm. Probably because my mom was always, like on me my mom was a big 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 factor in my life and mm -hmm. i was too scared to disappoint her mm -hmm. you know what i mean like she came here with you know three kids on her own and she's raising the kids she's working three jobs and <clears throat> i think even at that age i just said to myself well why do i want to you know she works so hard why do i want to join a gang and do something bad what if something bad happens to me what's going to happen to my mom and um it's just one of those things where i just said to myself you know, stick to sports, stick mm -hmm. to school sports. Um, and, I mean, the the project was pretty rough at that time. Like, mm -hmm. you were pulled every which way you can. I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm one of those guys that, like I said, I'm not religious, but I thank God that I was never pulled the wrong way because mm -hmm. it was very easy. It was yeah. very easy. Um, you were part of a crew or you were not, and if you were not, you were in trouble. Mm -hmm. So I, I was just happy that I somehow navigated through the right stuff, stayed in school, got a job, and, you know, eventually, um, you know, as I got older, you know, I got married, had my first child, and I did not want to live there for that situation, and I I chose to move out of Toronto um, for, uh, mostly for the safety of my kid, and uh, also for giving them maybe a better schooling, you know, better jobs. Um, I moved back in the day, Brampton wasn't bad. So I moved to Brampton, it was actually not a bad place. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, Brampton was uh, another, that's where I actually started most of my, um, I started my um, coaching career. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I came to Brampton and, and I, I was trying to find a gym where I can still compete and train. And it was so hard because I didn't know Brampton. Mm -hmm. And I was still working down, town Toronto so it was hard for me to train in Toronto then rush back and I don't know if you guys have noticed but like when you travel from Brampton to Toronto there's a go train you take and it's <laughs> it's not fun so uh, training was very hard and I I I stumbled into a gym called Champion Boxing Club in Brampton and um, I went in there and just had a just walked in and it's a beautiful gym nobody there mm -hmm. like nobody there and I thought to myself, wow, what a beautiful place and nobody's here. So I would train. I was there for two weeks and didn't see a person. I would just walk in and train. Nobody was there. <laughs> and then uh, one day I was uh, I came in a little earlier and I uh, was training. And the guy that owned the building, uh, John Malik at the time, um, he walked in and he goes, hey, you want to wanna become a pro? I looked at him, it's like a Rocky movie, you know? <laughs> uh, he was all dressed all in black and it looks very shady. And he's like, 
you can make you a pro. You can make you a Canadian champion in one year. I'm like, <laughs> said, no, I said, I'm, I'm having fun uh, training and, um, you know, I'm going to try some more amateur fights before I do anything. Mm-hmm. Ah, ah, you're wasting your time. And he walked out. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see the guy for another two, three weeks. So I've been training here for over a month, nobody there, and some people are walking in now, and they thought I was a coach because I, I knew what I was doing, and um, they're looking at me going like, hey, do you mind training us? Like, how much can I cost? Now, I didn't want to know what to say, so I'm like, I'll help you guys out, whatever, you know. So I, within a month or two, I, was, I, I went from like two, three to about 15 people in there, and I'm coaching these people. <laughs> One day, he only walks in again. John, he's like... Yeah, because uh, you're pretty good at this coaching stuff. Why don't you uh, take over my gym? He goes, I don't have the time for it, you know, and we worked out a deal. Yeah. And, you know, at the time they had some, it was just a quiet place, so a lot of people were coming in. And I actually, believe it or not, uh, when I started teaching, I still had aspirations to training, but I I was teaching all the time. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, well, if I make these guys really good, I'm going to have about 20 guys to spar with, and I'm getting the ring. And I met a lot of guys, actually, in MMA, Muay Thai. They all came in there. And, um, you know, fast-forwarding about a year later, I'm like, these kids are going to me, hey, coach, you know, I want to compete. Would you mind? And I'm like, oh. I go, how, th- how did I get into this? <laughs> you know, I went from training and wanting to, like, train and fight. Now I've, I've got people that want to compete for me. Mm-hmm. And I started coaching people for fights. Um, I, I got to know the business a little on my own. Uh, there wasn't too many coaches that were like offering help or mm-hmm. assistance in any way. Like I literally introduced myself to every gym in Brampton. There was I think three or four at the time, and like mm-hmm. just introduced myself. Hey, you know, you guys have any word of wi- you know words of wisdom, something that can help me out, kind of navigate me through the business? No, this is your own, your own kid. <laughs> And, you know, that was a story. I just started teaching, and um, I, it was one of the most passionate things because I, um, I had a lot of kids that got into trouble, mm-hmm. and they were coming in there to do their community hours. A lot of kids were coming in um, with certain issues, so the parents would bring them in to try to keep them out of trouble. Yeah. And uh, I'm looking at this going like, this is what I was looking for when I was a kid yeah. in the projects. Mm-hmm. And I wish somebody had said, hey, you know, there's a place here. You can do this, you know. And um, all of a sudden, it's like, it's a full circle. Yeah. Like, I'm actually giving back what the sport gave to me, which was, for me, it was a peace, that, you know, that quietness. Like, it gave me everything, you know, somewhere to belong. Mm-hmm. And, you know, 10 years later, I'm teaching a in Brampton, a champion boxing club. We have some great champions coming out of there. I got all these kids always looking for me, calling me at my house, you know, wanting to fight, you know, when they're in trouble. And I'm like, oh, my God. I mean, I've had students that were 14, 15, in trouble, coming to look somewhere to have an outlet. Mm-hmm. And fast-forwarding 15, 20 years later, you know, these guys are either police officers, doctors, you know, dentists, I have everything in you know in the market out there and it's nice to see you know like um right now i have my own place in mississauga and um you know every once in a while they come in with their kids yeah sometimes even grandkids yeah like three generations <laughs> yeah and it really makes you feel old when you're like holy jesus i've trained your grandfather your father and you <laughs> uh so i yeah it, it is uh nostalgic a little bit yeah but it definitely uh, brings back a lot of memories because, like I said, the way it started, I I wasn't meant to, like, I wasn't meaning to go into coaching. Mm-hmm. I just wanted a place to train. Yeah. I needed an outlet somewhere where I can just have peace and quiet and just train, you know? Yeah. And I ended up being a coach. Yeah. And my daughter is now two times, two or three times Canadian champ, one of the best fighters in Canada. And um, since she was small, I gave her the same... Yeah, I want to. I want to touch on that too. No worries. In a bit. Yeah, because uh, we we have some similarities, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. know, and like like I said, I've um, I think from Brampton, like um, what I realized too is like I want to. Um, I had this hunger to learn more about martial arts. Yeah, lots. I, mm-hmm. I just wanted to learn. Like even when I was competing and training, 
I would um, cross train a lot. I would do yep. um, boxing, and then when I have one minute rest, that rest for me was kicking because I loved kicking at the time. Um, I eventually like ended up um, moving out of Brampton and uh, going to Mississauga. Mm -hmm. I went to a place uh, called Combat Arts. So I uh, think never heard of that place. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's where we met a lot of guys. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. a hundred percent. Yeah, and um, that's where we actually met, uh, have met each other. Yes, it? yes, yes. So, and the funny part is, uh, Combat Arts probably was the first place that I've seen a full martial arts gym. It yeah. was it was a beautiful place. Uh, it, it it took me uh, like it's huge. I was I was astounded. I I've never seen, I guess that different because. Primarily for me, it's been uh, boxing. Yep. And um, I've never ventured out from the boxing. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, here I am at Combat Arts, and they have Muay Thai, they have Cali, they have wrestling, they have Jiu-Jitsu. I mean, I was looking at arts, I didn't even recognize. I was like, what is that? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, I met you guys through, I met you and a whole bunch of guys I still very close yeah. with. Um, Strickland. We'll yeah. mention him again today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody's going to think he's this mysterious character. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? He, he um, yeah, we met, we met there. We met outside of there. And, you know, throughout the years, I, I ventured through a couple of different gyms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I've, I gather a lot of knowledge, um, practice a lot of the different arts. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I ended up full circle. I turned back to my own place and just doing my own thing, which is, boxing um i do have a um, partner that has um, a background in martial arts and i also have a, uh, people that used to come in and teach a little bit of wrestling a little bit of jiu-jitsu and i still enjoy those arts a lot mm -hmm. um but it's uh, yeah it's been a journey and a half <laughs> yeah i remember so i came to martial art or to combat arts combat arts yeah. um primarily as a wrestling because they i mean I, that's what my background was i wrestled all my life yeah didn't have a choice <laughs> Um, <laughs> so I wrestled and then I got the exposure, same exposure you did. Yeah. I saw boxing, I saw jujitsu and I think the first thing that I wanted to do was try, you know, I see jujitsu and I'm like, that's, that's kind of close to wrestling. Let's give it a try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on the ground. <laughs> yeah, it's on the ground. We'll do it. So we tried that out and, you know, I fared fairly well. And then, you know, of course with the transition at the time, I think the MMA was coming up and up and just coming. starting. Yeah. Just starting. So yeah. the Toronto scene was there and we had some UFC fighters uh, yep. in their infancy, like Mark Bojek and Claude yeah. Patrick, and those guys yeah. coming in and yeah. they were training there as well. So they're like, I thought, Hey, maybe I'll give this, this boxing stuff a try. So yeah. I got into a few raps ra classes and, uh, I didn't last very long. And when I mean long, I mean, it didn't last like months or years and years. I did do an yeah. MMA fight and I think that, yeah that MMA fight kind of opened my eyes like there's too much training yeah. when you're training MMA you're going from one discipline to the next discipline so to the tough. next person so tough. and if you're weak in one of those areas you have to pay, pay attention to your weaknesses and one yeah. of my weaknesses was boxing because I've never hit anybody in my entire stand life up, the stand up round yeah. yeah so I mean I found that you know wrestling's got really good cardio yep but when I got to boxing and I got in the ring with you guys stuff like that, that was a different type of cardio and it, 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 it shocked my system. Well, I think I think it goes both ways. Yeah. And I found out the same way, right? Mm -hmm. um, we had a trainer there, Randy. I don't know if you remember. Yes. Randy. God bless he Passed away, yes. Uh, he he was incredible. I, I, I stayed in touch with him till almost the day he passed away. He was oh. very, very close. Um, and he was an amazing individual. Oh, man. man. He, had a, he had a heart of gold. And... and, and it was even before he was passing away. It didn't just, yeah. you know, he wasn't just turning into that person. He was yeah. always that person. Well, he had, he had the passion. Yeah. Like, he didn't do it for the money. He, he wasn't making very much money. He just did it for the passion. And yeah. um, he would constantly, like, bombard me with questions about stand-up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would ask him sometimes, show me some groundwork. Because, uh, like, we were touching up on the same thing. Stand up as his own conditioning. Mm -hmm. Like being in the ring and fighting is, is a different type of conditioning. You can run 10 miles a day, you're a beginner in the ring. Like, yeah. I don't care how much you run in the ring, you're going to so die. True. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when I tried a little bit of the wrestling, a little bit, like I did a little bit of wrestling when I was in high school, and mm -hmm. uh, in high school it was okay. Mm -hmm. And also you're young. Yeah. And when you're young, you have all the energy in the world. Um, I tried a little bit of wrestling, a little bit of jiu jitsu, and the jiu jitsu. I mean, 
you could have a guy that's 80 pounds on top of you, and if he knows how to use his weight, it feels like you're 300 pounds on top of you, and you just don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. A guy, you know, even women, like, they get in there, and, like, their strength is just like, oh, my God, mm -hmm. how do you get this woman off me? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and not in a good way. It's like, oh, my God. Like, it's suffocating, because yeah. when you're used to standing up, and just moving around, and you have a different type of cardio. Yep. But when you're on the ground, someone's holding you down, you don't have that kind of cardio. Yep. And you guys have the same issue. You're yep. on the ground, you're used to holding the guy down and wearing him down on the ground. Mm -hmm. Standing up is a whole different type. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. So we, I kind of had to trade off a little bit, and I'm sure you had to do the same. Yeah. And, you know, when I met you, I, I remember MMA was just starting to get popular. Um, yeah. It wasn't that UFC that you see now. It was back in the day, it was a little different. Mm -hmm. You primarily had one guy that would literally like get a hold of somebody, yeah. <laughs> hold them down for about 40 minutes, and all of a sudden choke them out. And you're yeah. like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it wasn't as fun. Yeah. Uh, boxing was still primarily like the sport to watch. Yeah. Uh, back in the day, too, they had kickboxing. Kickboxing yeah. was, you know, it was huge back in the day. Yeah. I mean, now you got K1, you got like you know karate you, you know especially with the the movies coming up you know oh yeah <laughs> you know? You've, you've got a what's the uh um I'm trying to remember cobra the, kai cobra here. kai after the spin off the karate kid thing yeah. right and uh, i mean you know you like i said i think k1's got a couple of different ones uh muay thai is huge yep. um you know i don't know if kickboxing will ever make a comeback that way but <laughs> you know we have so much arts now compared to back in the day yeah the arts just took off, mm -hmm. you know, like everything got famous. Like whenever a UFC guy had a, a specific style, that style would take off and mm -hmm. it would get so popular, you know, yeah. like Lyoto Mashida when he came in and he was just killing everybody. All of a sudden karate was huge. Yeah. Everybody went to the karate, mm -hmm. you know, you know, you had a couple guys that were wrestlers. All of a sudden wrestling got huge. Yeah. You know, and you know, for a little while, it was mostly stand-up. A lot of guys were doing Muay Thai, mm -hmm. kicking, 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 you know, Anderson Silva and the boys, and all yeah. of a sudden, it's like, oh, my God, you get a huge demand for Muay Thai and for kicking, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, stand-up has made full circle again, and I think it's starting to get very popular again. Yeah, boxing, you, know, you know, as much as I can't stand the fella, the Conor McGregor, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. coming out, and yeah. he did a lot for bringing boxing back into that realm. Yeah. You know, trying, he, shoot, he shoots his mouth off. That's what sells his tickets. He doesn't have the talent, um, the, uh, you know, that the upper echelon of those bo boxers have. I think there was a little bit of playing around in that that ring, maybe. I don't know what your perspective is on that, but I, I think he... I, you know what? He's uh, an amazing businessman. That's Yeah. He, you know, he did something that people only dream of. Like, yeah. there are people that have been boxing for, like, 30 years mm -hmm. and they probably never made a million dollars yeah they probably never will mm -hmm. uh, and now because of McGregor this guy came in there in his first pro boxing match yeah and he goes against Mayweather and makes you know millions <laughs> ridiculous and, you know, we, yeah. these guys are sitting back going like what the you know and mm -hmm. People are very jealous, very, like, you know, envious of this stuff because they're like, you know, I've been in this sport for how long? Yeah. And you hear you are on your first fight and you make it how much millions? And it was, like, probably the highest gross, you know, on, on TV that mm -hmm. people ever seen. Um, and it opened up the, I think, the doors for a lot of other guys that came in and said, oh, mm -hmm. that's the way it's done. Chandler's been trying to do that for a while, too. Yeah. And he's, you know, yeah. you know, not necessarily winning every fight, but... He, Sorry, who's that? Uh, Chandler. Oh, okay. You know, and, you know, you, you see now a lot of the UFC guys, they're all really good stand-up fighters. Mm -hmm. uh, they're starting to, a lot of the big fights are, like, mostly stand-up fights. Mm -hmm. You know, good boxing matches, good kickboxing yeah. matches. And the, the wrestling and the jiu-jitsu kind of took a little, little back step. Uh, I think they're starting to come back again. But for the most part, most of the guys that are like really top notch in the UFC, they're really good strikers. Yeah. Really good strikers. I, I remember working with you in the gym and realizing just how technical boxing can be. <laughs> you know, you think you go in there and you slug it out, but you know, there is much more, there's a, there's a science. For anybody that thinks that, hey, I'm gonna go in there, I'm just gonna dodge a, a punch here, here and there, but you're playing off of your opponent's actions, reactions, uh, you're setting up punches as well. It's not like you're throwing haymakers left, right, and center. You know, I I had a person, a friend of mine, 
say this to me when I first started boxing. Because mm-hmm. I would, like, I thought I knew everything. No, I thought I worked so hard, nobody's going to outwork me. Mm-hmm. And I'm talking about, like, jabbing for one hour mm-hmm. just to make sure that job never got tired, you know. And, yep. and uh, this guy said to me, he's been around for a long time. He, he started in kickboxing in Montreal. And um, he said to me, Rafi, he says, you don't understand something. He goes, it took me 10 years to master the jab. Mm-hmm. It took me 10 years. He goes, believe me when I tell you, it's not going to be any different for you. Uh, and he was like a world champion kickboxer. Like, yeah. um, I, I thought about that, and I go, what is he talking about, man? <laughs> so I, I, you know, I went through my, my, my stages, and um, sure enough, 10 years later, I'm going in the ring with pros, amateurs, it didn't matter. Yep. And my jab was so masterful that I said to myself, man, that, that MF, he was, he was correct about that. Yeah, yeah. That he was right. Like, and as I train fighters now, and I've had some fighters that have been with me for over 10 years, I tell them the same thing. I go, hey, you know, it, it takes about this long to master certain punches. And, you know, nowadays everything's fast-paced. Everything's fast-forwarded real quick now. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody takes shortcuts here and there, and, you know, there's more information out there now. Everything's on YouTube, you know, you can do extra work, this, that. So a lot of people are still trying to fast-track stuff. But you know what? When you get in their ring, you still need to have put that time in. There's no replacing that. Mm-hmm. You still got to put that 10,000 hours, whatever you need to do, whatever people say. I, for me, I tell them, it took me about 10 years to master my sport the way I wanted it. Mm-hmm. And I was, and I'm still that happy. But I, I was so happy that I could do stuff like a pro, and I was beautiful to do. Um, and I watch kids, and it usually is about that ten year gap when you see them really come into their own, you know, into their manpower or women power. You know, they get very strong, and and their their skill set in. So it's something you can't escape. That's something like there's no magic potion. There's no, you know, give me something. This tricks. No, it's you got to put that work in. You know, when you see these guys in the ring and they're doing 10, 12 rounds, believe me, that's 10, 12 rounds that, like, you know, um, you can't get past that. You know what I mean? Like, you can't. It's something that you have to um, you have to go through. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a rite of passage. You have to go through the pain. You know, like, this is where they get that body, that shirt, that blood, sweat, and tears. Mm-hmm. You, you've been in this. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? You bled, you sweated, you hurt. I've been there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've witnessed it. And, um, and I tell people there's no substitute in that. Mm-hmm. There isn't no substitution for that. You literally have to go through it. You know? I remember your, your classes or when I come and train with you. Jab, jab. And I'm holding these little weights. And, you know, <laughs> and it was just consistently doing it. I'm like, what are we going to move on to something else, man? This is, you're getting me. You're killing me here. But again, what you're talking about. Is yeah. you have to go through. You have to put the work in, and you have to have that mental mindset to be able to push yourself to that point of past. Well, I start to realize that my coach knows something, and you better damn well listen. Otherwise, you're not going but, to progress. But I think I think to a lot of coaches do that, and the good coaches I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are not real coaches, but a lot of these older coaches they used to do that, and it took me a long time to understand. Like, mm. so when I'm in a gym. I put them through those boring, boring exercises, <laughs> yeah. holding that little two pound weight yeah. for 20, 30 minutes, yeah. which becomes like a 30 pound weight after a while. Yes. Because it lets me know, is this a person that actually wants to learn? Mm-hmm. Or is this a person just kind of want like saw a Rocky movie and they're like, oh, I just want to see, I want to do, the, you know, because most of these kids nowadays, they're so privileged. They I literally think I failed that test, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you were, at least you, I knew you were an athlete and yeah. I knew... Let me see if he really wants to learn this. Because yeah. like I said, a lot of kids nowadays, they don't want that. They mm-hmm. see something and, you know, they just want to, like, I have coaches that I'm training to be coaches too. Mm-hmm. And I tell them all the time, stop giving the fighters their dessert before they even start their dinner. Mm-hmm. And they look at me like, what do you mean, coach? I go, well, if you put them on the pads and do all this fancy stuff on the pads with them, what makes them want to go back and do the basics? Mm-hmm. They don't. They never learn the proper foundation. They never learn the proper technique. Mm-hmm. They just go to fancy, all the fancy stuff, and then all of a sudden they're like, sooner or later they get knocked out because you know they never learn the proper things. Mm-hmm. 
for me, it's all about that structure. You got to give them structure, especially with kids. Give them the proper structure. And with boxing, unlike a lot of different arts, with boxing, what it always gave me was, and maybe I'm being biased. For me, it's always been my boxing's always been probably the best self defense, and I've done a lot. Mm-hmm. I've done a lot of different things. I've done you know Muay Thai. I've done some little jiu jitsu, little wrestling. But nothing in the street fight will ever, ever come close to what boxing can give you. Mm-hmm. It, there's just no sport that, w- that will give you that, I feel confident, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, for yourself as a wrestler, before you get a hold of a guy, you're probably getting a couple good shots. Yeah. And you don't want to do that. No. Well, a jiu-jitsu guy, same thing. Mm-hmm. He's good on the ground, but... That's why they jump the guard real, way, real yeah. quick. Yeah, and and yeah. even in kicks, you know, in the yeah. street, if you throw the wrong kick and you slip or you, you know, you're wearing jeans, you can't really, like, you know, mm-hmm. prepare yourself. Whereas in boxing, you, you're constantly ready. Yep. You're, you're used to having close, in-range fighting. Mm-hmm. You're used to fighting on the outside. You also start to recognize when somebody's attacking you. Mm-hmm. You learn how to move. That's what boxing is. Somebody even blinks towards you. You move away and you counter. Mm-hmm. So it always gave me that. And I think a lot of people have never really thought about that. Because, I mean, boxing's always been, I always say it's had a black eye for reputation. Mm-hmm. But like I said, as, as a kid growing up, I'm so happy that I learned it. And I think all kids should learn some kind of martial arts growing up. Because it does put them on the right path. And it teaches them about confidence and discipline. And that's something that the new young generation lacks. Yeah, when I I want to talk about that again, you know I've I've you, as you know you know I've worked with gang impacted youth for a long time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've actually studied it, and you know now we're in a prevention mode here with the Engage Four One Six uh, group that I I work with. And when you look at the the science behind what actually pushes and pulls these kids into the gang subculture, yeah, and I'm sure you'd be familiar with this because you actually came from an area that was impacted by gangs. Right. Um, but one of the big things is, and there's there's many of them, but this not just this, but one is single parent uh, homes, lack of la- lack of parent pr- uh, supervision, mm-hmm. one, but lack of mentorship, right? So when you don't have structure in your in your home, when you don't have structure in your life, right. uh, you have the you, and nobody's teaching you boundaries either. You have. You, if you don't seek those people out, you're going to find boundaries and other spots to get into. And those boundaries may be, you know, where the law hasn't quite got you yet. Yeah. But when you go to a facilities like you did, like you went and found that role model, that, yeah. that, 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 that individual that said, hey, you know what, come in here and you can clean the gym and, and, and do this. What I absolutely love is your story is how it's gone full circle to where, you know, now you recognize these kids that are in those spots. Well, the funny thing is I've had a lot of parents um, constantly tell me, you're very military, your kids. And I said, yes, I am. Um, And the reason being is because when I grew up in the projects, I was constantly looking for something. You know, I tried to do the cadets. I wanted to join the army. Like, I was always constantly looking for something to give me uh, structure, to give me discipline. I, I needed that because I seen what the other guys do. I seen what the other life does, and I didn't want that. Mm-hmm. A lot of kids nowadays, they get, you know, they, there's a lot of YouTube. Yeah. Too much information, you know? Yeah. Let me ask you, what yeah. were you seeing when you were a kid, like, in, in those areas? Oh, my God. Like, I mean... Again, I'm going back to the 70s and 80s in the projects in Toronto. I mean, you're looking at guys smoking up in front of your door, trying to give you stuff to take. Um, you know, there were drugs weren't as huge as it was, but it was coming up. A lot of stuff was coming up. And, you know, you see it all the time. And your friends look at you like, hey, man, here, be cool like us. Mm-hmm. And you're like, uh, no, thanks. Yeah. Oh, why are you such a square? Like, why? Just be one of us. I don't I don't really like that. And it was just one of those things that, like, I had a very close relationship with my mom. It was me, myself, my brother, and my sister, and we watched each other, and we just didn't have that in us to, you know, be influenced that way. I just didn't have that. My mom was always on me about, you know, going to school, learning a, a trade, and, you know, being a good person. Um, 
and and touching a little bit on what you were said, like I mean, it's hard because here's a single mom that has to work three jobs. She can't be home twenty four seven. So what do the kids do when they finish school? You know, you're getting bullied in school. You're getting torture sometimes. You know, take drugs, this that. All of a sudden, you're home. Now you're in the projects where like there's crime infested. There's people shooting each other, people beating each other up on the streets. Like you see this on a daily basis, and um, I. You know, you have to have some kind of outlet. For me, I always look for it. Like, I even went to a YMCA. I went to a boys, um, it was a, one of those boys clubs where you can go and play sports. Mm -hmm. So we constantly try to find something. I, we went, there's a place up, uh, oh my God, college in the Diana area, Scott Mission. Mm -hmm. And it would give kids like us a chance to go on trips. Uh, we went on trips, uh, they gave us food. Sometimes they would have stuff for us to do. And we were young kids, 12, 13, 14. And once you get to a certain age, you start to look for other things. You know what I mean? And for me, I, I don't know what it was. I was, I was just very fortunate. Maybe my mom was always in my head. And I, I always wanted to do sports. I always wanted to do good and everything. I didn't want no part of drugs. I didn't want no part of alcohol. Mm -hmm. I didn't want any part of the gang mentality. Because I, I knew I didn't have the heart for it. Mm -hmm. when you see the people you're with and they're jumping f you know four or five guys on one to rob him of his wallet or whatever and you're sitting back going like feeling bad for the guy mm -hmm. you know you're not you don't want to be part of that and you know a lot of people go oh why didn't you help well back in the day you don't because you still got to go home with those guys yeah they live here so if you say anything negative you're getting your ass kicked by them too yeah. then you got to worry about your family so And that's still happening to this day. Oh, yeah, 100%. That, you know, all these young kids that are coming up right now, they're influenced by the older guys because the older guys are driving the nice cars, they got the money, you know, and, and the young kids get influenced by this. So, you know, moving forward, like I said, I'm in the gym. I have a lot of these young kids, and they're constantly asking me for advice. Um, you know, I've been enough uh, enough things in my life that I can actually give the kids, hey, I know what you're going through, been there, this is how I handled it, this is not the way you handled it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I made my mistakes, I made my errors, um, you know, I've had to do that with my child, mm -hmm. my daughter, and, um, you know, I have four beautiful grandkids, mm -hmm. and they love their poppy, they're just like all about me, they look at me, they're like this big strong guy, I'm looking at them like, wow, this mm -hmm. has come full circle, like, yeah. Jesus, man, like, and... I never had that growing up. I never had that uh, father figure behind me. Mm -hmm. I never, like, my mom was too busy, God bless her. You know, like, she's just so happy, like, making us have a place at home, having food, having clothes. And you don't realize that until you're older. It's like, oh, my God, my mom sacrificed so much for me. Like, Sacri for, a single, for a single woman to be taking care of three kids, especially as teenagers, you know, Hmm. And, um, you know, up to this day, I've never talked back to my mother. <laughs> I was always very close with her. Yeah. And uh, seeing her as I was growing up, I got really good jobs. And all I wanted to do was give her anything she needed. Up to this day. I go see her probably like every two days, every every day if I can. I go buy her groceries. I take her to the store so she doesn't have to move around. She, you know, she's 89 and she's still... Faster than I am. She runs everywhere, you know. <laughs> She keeps me busy, you know. I love Four it. or five bags of groceries I got to carry and yeah. let's go. <laughs> and she's so strong. And, and I said, I think that's what always gave me. I got that from her. Yeah. She was always very happy with life. Uh, she was thankful and grateful for everything she had. Mm -hmm. For me, I'd sometimes go like, she didn't have anything, but she was so grateful. She was grateful that she could go to work. Mm -hmm. She was grateful that she could feed her kids. Mm -hmm. And... You know, I think that's something that this new generation doesn't have. That they're they're entitled to everything. If they don't have it, they, they, I gotta go see a shrink. I gotta go see. I gotta, you know, like I I see things now that makes me go, what what happened to this world? You know. Yeah. So yes, I am military at my gym with my kids. Yes, a hundred percent. And the kids sometimes don't like it. I don't. I don't care. Yeah, but that's structure. Then that's I'm, what kids. Do I'm gonna be tough on them. Yeah. I will call them out in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, when they do great, at the end of the night, I tell them, hey, you know what? I was really good today. Yeah. You really improved. You really did something right. And yeah. you can see the smile on their face. They beam and they're like, oh, 
my God, coach says something nice to me. Yeah. And I'm really tough on my kids. But I said to them, hey, listen, life's not nice. You go down that world out there, it's not nice. Mm-hmm. You're 15 right now, wait till you get about 18, 19. Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, I I worked down on Bay Street. Uh, probably one of the biggest first jobs I ever got was on Bay Street. I worked right up by the Stock Exchange, all the different brokers down there. And, um, you know, I was 19, 20, and I was a kid that just, like, out of the projects. Mm-hmm. People look at you funny, you're like, what's this kid doing here? <laughs> you know, it, it was a different world back in there. It was a very different world. So now I see these kids, and, you know, you and I can actually relate to this. We're like, you have a kid that's 10, 12 years old, and they got an iPhone. It's a thousand dollars a week, you know. <laughs> I mean, I think I was like probably like almost twenty before I got my first phone. <laughs> and I, I was, we just didn't have phones, and you know, kids nowadays they have access to everything, so they don't appreciate anything. I couldn't even get a big wheel out of my parents when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for those of you that don't know what big wheels were, yeah, yeah. plastic bikes yeah. that, were, <laughs> that that you pedaled and they were about five inches from the ground, and you, I, uh, I couldn't get that from my parents. Let's, so. see, let's see if we can get you one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But you know the funny part is like I watch these kids nowadays, and I mean my grandkids, yeah. they have machines that look like cars. They're racing. It's like I, like they have mm-hmm. the stick. They have everything. These kids go and they have TVs the size of the wall, and they have so much games going on. And I'm looking at this going like, I don't even know how to turn these things on. Mm-hmm. Like I have no clue what like technology just took off on us. Yep. It literally went overnight, mm-hmm. and I couldn't keep up. A lot of people didn't keep up. Yeah, I was just like, what the hell happened? Mm-hmm. You know, and when these kids come to the gym, um, they're entitled. Mm-hmm. They're privileged. They're entitled. Like, I've had kids go back to their parents, he's too hard on me, he's picking on me. <laughs> and, and I have the mothers, you know, because they don't take ownership, because parents, they don't look at a gym as a place to go and get their kids uh, discipline or give them something to you know to look forward to. No, it's just like I need to go shopping. Mm-hmm. I need to drop them off somewhere, and that's the big issue. They're just dropping them off, and these kids don't really want to be there. Mm-hmm. So the kids don't appreciate it, so they go go and complain. Mm-hmm. And I've had parents come to me, oh, you're too tough on them. This this. I go, I'm sorry. I go, but if your child comes in twenty minutes late, jumps into a class, and is talking to other people creating disturbance, I'm going to call him out on it. Mm-hmm. But he doesn't know your rules. Hmm? He's going to find out. Because sooner or later, in a real world, he's going to find out the hard way too. You know, you can't just be privileged and let mommy or daddy come and save you because you feel like you've been treated unfairly. I'm, I'm tough on my kids, but because I know a lot of them want to compete one day. Even if they don't, I'm trying to give them that discipline that I learned from boxing and I, I was a very quiet kid um, you know in my time it wasn't like now where these kids talk so much you know back in the day people I think somebody like yourself myself we just weren't that talkative we have more respect for adults we have more respect for our parents and you knew your pecking order and you knew well, there was just a little more respect I think we had just more respect now they don't have that mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, I get little kids sometimes, eight, nine years old, talking, whining, complaining, and I go, and the moms are watching me going like, what do you do, right? And I'm looking Mm -hmm. at this kid going like, listen, I know what you have at home, but you can't argue with me. If I tell you to do something, do it, Mm -hmm. because you're you're mine for one hour, so I'm trying to teach you something, so don't try to like, well, let's see if we can like barter, see if we can do this, that. No, that's not what it's about. I'm going to have you here, I'm going to make you do some work. Mm -hmm. And usually when they leave, they're happy. But at the beginning, they try to, like, you know. And, and it's something I think, like, I wish there was more support from the city. I wish there was more support from the higher people that, that would help a good boxing gym. Because um, somebody like myself, like, I mean, I have a hard time just trying to make the rent for the gym. And, you know, you get no support from anybody. Mm-hmm. But you're trying to give people a good thing here. I mean, if you have your kids and they're troublemakers, you want them somewhere. Like I have, yesterday I had three people walk in and they're like, 
oh my god my kids get into streets in school you know like they set up fights and this that can you help me i'm like <laughs> i don't know how to deal with this but i said well if you bring him into the gym maybe i can give him some kind of like maybe i can give him a little more you know structure maybe i can teach him not that's not the way to do it mm -hmm. it's safer here and you can learn something and not have to go do it in the street because you're not getting paid for that so what are you doing it for you know mm -hmm. um you know i've had to sit down and talk to these kids because hey you know, there's people that don't fight fair. They don't think about, I'm going to beat this guy up with my skills. No. You see in school now where girls are getting stabbed, they're getting jumped, they're getting shot, and it's like, it's a very violent world. Mm -hmm. So I try to give this kid saying, hey, you know what? Instead of going and looking for trouble, why don't you come into the gym? Help me out. Yeah. Come in here, I'll teach you, you help me teach the younger ones. And I've had a lot of kids make a big turnaround where they're not in trouble anymore, they're doing great in school, they got a job, and when they love coming into the gym and helping the kids out, and I sometimes I look at them and I go, Wow, this, this is really nice to see. Yeah. Oh, I love this coach. He goes, you know, I'm trying to teach him just the way you taught me because I want them to really, you know, mm -hmm. to see what I feel. You know, these are kids that are like 17, 18, and they're, you know, I got my little 8, 10 years old, and and I'm trying to give them that. And I find that these tough guys, you know, they try to be tough in school. They try to be tough on the streets. But when they're given something like this, a little outlet, it's different. They change. Mm -hmm. You know, like I have big, tough kids trying to help little kids. Mm -hmm. You know, they're holding pads for the girls. Oh, okay, yeah, this is fun, coach, you know. Yeah. And when they have that, it's different. And I, and I, you know, for me, I think that's what's lacking in, in this community is that we don't have the people that have the funding help out a gym to bring kids in, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then maybe develop a program for unprivileged, like, you know, like I said, I grew up like that, unprivileged kid that didn't have money. I had to clean the gym to be able to train for, for, for free mm -hmm. and get some training in. Um, I wish there was that in place of what's going on now because I think it would help out a lot of these young kids that have so much raw energy you know, anger, but they have no no outlet to take it. Mm -hmm. They have no outlet. If 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 gyms like boxing gyms would you know get that funding to help, maybe they can bring in some of these kids and go. Hey, you know what? There's a program you can go there twice a week, three times a week. You know, like I have my kids that say to me sometimes, Coach, I can't afford it this month, and I go, Okay, help me clean up. Mm -hmm. You know, they help me clean up the gym. They help me clean the bags after everybody finishes and mop the floors. Sometimes I just tell them, hold the pads for the kids. Yeah. And it helps me, helps them. Mm -hmm. And and I could see that they're very thankful. And I could see that they, they found something different. And believe me, I've had a lot of kids that got in trouble with the law. And once they're in the gym, they're more afraid of getting in trouble with me or me kicking them out of the gym <laughs> than they are of the police. Yep. And that is an amazing yeah. thing in itself. Because... Yeah. Yeah. You have earned their respect yeah. so much just through teaching them discipline. And I think, and I, you know, as you know, I coach as well, and I see yeah, mm -hmm. some similarities that you're talking about with my kids when, they, when I'm coaching them, and I do see sometimes where the parents hand them over, oh, yeah. and they say, okay, well, go do what you gotta do. And, you know, there are kids in there that have lacked discipline, yeah. and you really gotta, really gotta be on them. And I've had kids quit on me because, or, and parents pull them out because of, I'm that type of person that won't put up with be behavior. Too tough. I, I, because you know, as yeah. in a pra your practice room, yeah. if you have somebody not following the rules and you've told them three or four times and they're not listening, listen, and if they're yelling at you in a gym, yeah. are you going to let that tolerate? You can have that at home. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. But when, it, when it's here and it's affecting my people, my athletes, it's done. Because in the real world, the real world, not in the, you know, behind the doors in your house. Mm -mm. In the real world, if your kid starts acting like that, mm -hmm. your kid's going to get shown the door real quick. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think the worst part is, like I said, it's like um, I don't pay favorites. I've had my daughter and I've kicked my daughter out of the gym. Let's talk about your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> you, She's going to love this. Scarlett, yes. Um, you know, Scarlett is... Um, She's got her own world right now. Yeah. She really does have her own world. Yeah. She is doing so much. Uh, she's traveling with the, the Team Canada so much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, was it like 
year and a half ago, she, she went to Continentals. She won a gold medal for Canada. Mm -hmm. She came back, won the Canadian Championships again. Um, she's traveled. She's traveled to Finland. She's going to France next week. Like she's, I think the Pan Am Games are in South America, Chile, or mm -hmm. I think Chile. Um, so she's just constantly traveling, and you know, we were just talking about this the other day. How I said to her, I said to her, "It's going to take you this long," and she goes, "No, Dad." It, she's she's always been competitive with me. Mm -hmm. My daughter, you know. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm from Ecuador. Her mom's from Poland. So I always said to her, you're hard-headed. <laughs> I don't know where you get it from, but you're very hard-headed. <laughs> and since she was small, she's very attached to me, but she's very, very uh, competitive. Um, when I took her to combat arts when I met you, um, her mom didn't want her near boxing. So we put her into wrestling. Absolutely and, awesome. Awesome sport, by the way. Amazing sport. Actually, it was because you know what? Yeah. I think wrestlers are probably the craziest, strongest athletes that I know. Mm -hmm. You know, and my daughter proved that. Like, these girls are like young and they're like flipping 200 pound tires, and you got looking like, whoa, wow, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what is going on? What is in their cereal nowadays? You know? <laughs> but, I, you know, she actually made the Canadians in the first year to try wrestling, mm -hmm. which you know is unheard of. And she's very good at wrestling. Um, and I, I try to put her into a, I've always taught her like a little bit of, a little bit of kicking, a little bit of kicking. Um, I've taught her slowly some boxing for self defense purposes, which she really needed because she's very fair, very white. Mm -hmm. And when I was in Brampton, it was a little bit of you know this that, and um, she had to defend herself a couple of times. And um, um, when she turned sixteen, she literally looked at myself and her mom said you know I had enough I choose boxing mm -hmm. I want to box okay and what happened was uh, she was she went to a wrestling tournament which in high school teachers that are doing the wrestling really don't know about wrestling they just kind of like there so okay, just let me say this yeah you said that I didn't yeah yeah <laughs> yeah maybe it's changed I don't know but <laughs> I remember going to some of her meets and they were wrestling for like 30 minutes trying to beat the hell out of each other, their own teammates, before they wrestle. And nobody's watching them. And I'm like, I'm so disciplined with my sport that I'm like, hey, you can't be doing that. High school teachers, they were just there, as, I guess. I don't know. They were there. They're not really wrestlers. they just coaching them. And a lot, of, a lot of schools, that's what they do. They coach, but they don't really know the sport. They just coach it, right? Maybe they volunteer. I don't know. I can't really say much about it, but... Either way, my, my daughter won. She won a lot of good tournaments. And um, the last fight that she had, she, she was in the gold medal round. Mm -hmm. And she was beating the girl like 9 nothing on points. And she still kind of looked at the referee like, what are you doing? Just stop this fight, you know. Mm -hmm. She's not going to beat me. I like 10 seconds to go. So the girl did a really sloppy, tried to take a single leg. Yeah. And my daughter sprawled. And I guess as she sprawled, she popped her hip. But she held the girl down. That's how crazy my daughter. <laughs> she held the girl down. The bell went. She won. Yeah. She flips over. Ah, starts screaming. Now, I'm at the gym here in mm -hmm. Mississauga. This is in Sarnia, I think. Okay. So I get a call from uh, Cap. Oh. He's a wrestler on that. So he called me. He goes, um, your daughter's okay. Right there. I'm like, what? What happened? <laughs> it, seemed, it was a little problem, you know. Don't worry. She's okay, Ralph. She's just, you know, I just want to let you know. She did have an issue. She kind of popped her hip I'm like what the mm -hmm. <laughs> I am going crazy um, but the way he explained it he, he's trying to make me laugh about it he's like buddy he goes she won the gold medal but as she's going out they have her I guess the ambulance guy that they put her on some stuff to numb the pain or whatever mm -hmm. she still got a trophy in her head I got gold you know and <laughs> she didn't care about the pain um, so that kind of took her out for about um, eight months should have been longer, but eight months she was out. Mm -hmm. And when she came back, that's what she said. She goes, I'm done. She goes, I want a box. Okay. And her mom finally looked at me and said exactly that. She goes, okay, I guess you can watch her. <laughs> and that was her Her journey started there. And it's been battle, 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 battle. But I'm so tough on her because, like, I, I'm tougher on her than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And... Is because I know what the sport can do for you. Mm -hmm. I also know what it can do to you. Mm -hmm. And um, 
it's not an easy sport. And, um, you know, when she first started boxing, there wasn't too many girls. Now, I mean, the girls have taken over the sport. The ladies are just, like, so high-caliber fighters. And she's on top. Mm -hmm. You know, she's on top, and she's done great. Um, I stopped training her about two years ago, um, fully knowing that this girl's going to go places. She's going to be traveling everywhere. I can't be there because I got to run a business. Mm -hmm. You can't be traveling everywhere every week, you know. But I think the greatest part about that journey is now you get to watch. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to. You don't have to fight with her to to go. Hey, you, well, you're doing this wrong. No. You're doing that. You're doing. And of course, you know, you know as well as I know, uh, my father was my coach, yes. and I remember having those battles, and I'm sure you had those battles with oh, her, yeah. Oh, yeah. where it was like, Dad, you're wrong. F you, this and that. And they're, you know, of course, you're right. You're always right because you're the coach, right? But you're not having those battles anymore. Now you get to sit in the corner and say, you know, know, kid. You know, it's funny. um, Last year, when she won the Brampton Cup, Mm -hmm. uh, we weren't in the best place. Um, I I was a little angry with her about a couple of things. But regardless, you know, your kids are your kids and, you know, you have to be there for them. but she went to the Brampton Cup, which is a, probably the biggest tournament in Canada right now. It's huge. And um, we saw each other there, you know, right away we hugged each other. She was just overjoyed because I'm, she's a daddy's little girl. She yeah. really is. She really is. And um, she, she absolutely like stole the show that weekend and she got best fighter of the tournament. She, um, best bout of the night. Um, and you know she was so happy to share that with me and i always say to her this is my favorite part now like when she won the canadians this year i love just watching Mm -hmm. there's no nerves for me i can just actually just watch her and you know she kept looking over she saw me watching she's smiling and she's so happy um and then i usually take her we usually have a big dinner Mm because I always say, I hope my daughter dates a really rich guy one day, because she is not, she's not McDonald's, Burger King, no, no, buddy, we're going to a restaurant, it's two, three hundred dollar meals, and I'm like, God, <laughs> but she, she loves having time now with me, where we, you know, we just watch a movie together, she'll mm-hmm. fall asleep on my shoulder watching a movie, mm-hmm. um, we go for walks together, you know, we go for dinner, but like, sometimes she loves it when I cook, she loves when I cook, and uh, she's just a very happy girl now. Because now we're father daughter. I don't have to be that extra guy, that coach that grinds her and tells her. You know, she, I'm the guy that tells you what you don't want to hear. Mm-hmm. But that's what coaches do. Mm-hmm. Coaches are not gonna blow smoke up your butt. They're gonna say, "Hey, this is the real stuff," you know. And we have to tell athletes what they don't want to hear. Mm-hmm. You know, the good athletes they're gonna hear that and go, "Okay, it makes sense." But most athletes they don't want to hear that. They want you to like caress their ego they don't want to be told the truth and and that's why a lot of fighters jump from gym to gym or this or that because they don't want to hear it, something that's tough on them right they don't want to build that relationship and that you know that that comfort thing with, with your coach right uh, my daughter like she had no choice <laughs> for a long time but you know as she got older I, I used to send her to gyms just to on her own just to get that experience because I needed her to see what the other side was like. And she always came back, she goes, I did so good, I did this, I did that. And I go, why did you do that? Just doing what you taught me to do. I go, so maybe the old man knows a little bit. I never said anything that, I'm like, <laughs> you know, but this is us all the time, bickering with each other, right? Now we don't have to do that because she's a grown ass woman now, <laughs> you know, and she's a champ and, you know, we joke around a lot. We we have that daddy daughter time now. It's beautiful. That part is my favorite now. You I'm did. sure you have that too. <laughs> You've done your job, man. Oh, I, you know yeah. what? It's never done, but I yeah. did I did that part. Mm-hmm. So now I can just enjoy and and just be uh, supportive. Yeah, you know one of the uh, actually one of the guests that I had on this podcast before his name's uh, Jim Richardson, uh-huh. and he was the uh, University of Michigan swim coach. And I, I've talked to that guy numerous times. I actually uh, love talking to him. But one of the things that he said, there was a study done uh, on U.S. swimmers, and they had asked these U.S. swimmers, what do you want to hear from your parent in regards to your performance? Mm-hmm. And 
a vast majority came out and said they just want to hear I love watching you swim mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and now you get to do that yeah which yeah. is amazing and I'm sure that's why you, you feel that way you know there's it, a big smile on your face just talking about her so I know <laughs> it is you know it's funny because I was thinking about it um, when she won the Canadians when she was like I said to her before the tournament started I go you know I said Scarlett um, I saw the the people that you're fighting I think your head and shoulder above these two ladies that I think you should like walk through the hoop with ease. And she goes, oh my God, dad, don't put pressure on me. I go, no, so I'm not, listen, I go, I know the work you put in. Mm -hmm. I know the work I put in. I go, you're going to walk through these ladies. I go, this is not me bragging. I'm just telling you this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. I, I honestly think you're probably going to stop these girls. And she's like, oh my God, dad, that's too much pressure, too much pressure. And I said, I think if you just breathe, relax, and and realize how much hard work you put in compared to these other girls, I think you can agree with me. Mm -hmm. So she stopped the first girl, and she looked at me. She goes, "Oh my God, Dad! Oh my God, that was exhilarating." I go, "Okay." I said, "Tomorrow's gold medal's gonna be nothing simpler." She's like, "Dad, please don't put pressure." I go, "I'm not putting pressure." I go, "I I'm confident. I'm confident what you're gonna do." Mm -hmm. So when right before the bell went and I could see her face she just absolutely destroyed the girl mm -hmm. and um, uh, when she was waiting for the decision she just looked over and I was videotaping because so I wanted that I that videotaped moment. that situation and you can see her face go from serious to just like and she just let out a scream and I'm like holy mac that, that was it right there that's mm -hmm. the that's like gold like when you win something like that because you work so hard that's a payoff right there. And um, as soon as she got that, she came running around the ring and she jumped on me and everybody's taking pictures. And I'm, I looked at it and I go, that's what I was talking about. I go, it's it's not bragging. I know what you can do. I go, you just got to go and do it. Mm -hmm. I go, you also got to fight with confidence. Like, it's one thing to respect your opponents. Another thing to, I go, but don't fall into that. Like, I don't know, I don't know. I'm not just, You know what you can do. Just go out and do it. Mm -hmm. You know, and... She was so happy, and um, I think that's something, before a fight, she always calls me. Yeah. She still calls me, she goes, Dad, this is a video of the girl I'm fighting, what do you think? What do you think I should do? And we just kind of break it down, she's like, that's what I thought, okay. <laughs> you know? But it, it's beautiful, because yes, now I get, I get to be a dad. Yeah. But like I tell her, I'm a dad every day in the gym. Mm -hmm. I, I got 40, 50 kids every night that I just like, ages from 8 to 15 to 20. Like, I mean, I got officers in there that are, like, fighting soon. And they're like, Coach, what do you think? Coach, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, I've, I've been a coach now for over 30, ooh, close to 35 years. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't something that I was looking to do. Mm -hmm. But I fell into it, and I fell in love with doing it. And now I just do it for the passion of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I really love watching people that actually appreciate what you want to teach them, all that, give you that knowledge, you know. And, and it's hard to find that because it's not necessarily, like, just boxing. When they come to my boxing gym, like, I've I've had to sit down and talk to grown men because mm -hmm. they have issues at home or they have issues at work, da, 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 da. Like, I have one guy, coach, he's a big guy, you know, big burly guy. He's like, coach, you got a minute, you got a minute? You know, mm -hmm. he's, he's um, I'm thinking he's Lebanese, but... You know, very deep access, fresh in the country, and mm -hmm. he's just very, like, upset. And I go, what's wrong? Sorry, sorry, coach. You know, can I sit down and just give you, can you give me five minutes? I go, sure. Mm -hmm. And he explains to me, you know, this happened at work. Apparently some guy spit on his face, and, oh. you know, he didn't know what to do. He didn't want, he goes, I was so mad, coach. I wanted to kill this guy, but I don't want to get kicked out of the country. And I know if I do something, they're going to charge me. And I go, okay. He said, what did you do? I don't know, coach. She goes, I just, I just walked away. And I go, good. That was the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I go, if you had done something and you hurt the guy, you would get in trouble. Mm -hmm. So you did the right thing by walking away. The other thing you can do, I go, and it's not something that I, you know, you want to hear, but like, you know, sometimes you, maybe you got to call 911 and say, hey, this guy spit on me. Mm -hmm. That apparently is an assault charge. So, so you it could, is. So you could actually charge him for that. Mm -hmm. He has a video of it and everything. I go show it to the police and, you know, 
That way, because he was afraid the guy might come back and attack him again. Mm -hmm. But like, he just needed to talk and vent. Yeah. You know, he's showing me the videos, everything. He feels better. Now when he comes in, he just trains. Mm -hmm. But he, he, you know, he says to me, thank you for helping because he goes, I just needed to talk. Mm -hmm. You know, I have women that come in there, they're stressed out. They want to talk for two, three minutes. So sometimes I got to spend a couple hours just talking to people left mm -hmm. and right because that's what they need. Yeah, yeah, they come to the gym because they want to hit something, yeah. But a lot of times they need to have five minutes with a coach or somebody just to talk. They just need somebody to talk to sometimes. And I'm like, well, I guess it goes back to what we say, what coaches are. Coaches are not just that guy that screams at you in a Rocky movie. Hey, Rocky, do this. You know, that's not the guy, you know. Like, coach is a guy that's going to tell you, okay, what are you eating? Mm -hmm. You're not eating? No, don't eat McDonald's. No. <laughs> What are you drinking? No, don't drink that. How many hours are you sleeping? Oh, that's not good either. Mm -hmm. As weird as it sounds, I got to go through that every day. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about just kids, adults. Yep. You know, adults. Mm -hmm. And that's been my life. It's like, I think, um, having to listen to everyone about little things here, little things there. Uh, listen to the kids. Because you can see some of them just like reaching out for help. Yeah. And you have to be there, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, I have a little girl right now that she's 11 years old, tough little girl, created a cute little thing. And like constantly talking about girls in school, fighting, fighting, fighting. Coach, I get challenged. I got to do it. I got to do it. And you're like, no, you don't have to. Yeah. You don't have to. You got to be here. If you get in trouble out there, you can't come here. Mm -hmm. and this is an everyday thing. Yeah. You know, like you're sometimes you're a shrink. Sometimes you're a parent. Sometimes you're a nutritionist. Sometimes you're a chiropractor. Sometimes you got to be this. You got to be that. <laughs> so as you get into that, you know, long, long, long activity of being a coach, you, you realize, oh, my God, this, this should be, <laughs> this, we should have a lot more uh, benefits for this because, mm -hmm. you know, you have a lot. You have a lot. Like I said, I've... Um, I, th I, I think you're going to find yeah. that you've impacted a great many people yeah. and people that you don't even know that you've impacted and, and some of even their families that you've impacted as a result of the energy yeah. and time that you've invested not only in the sport with them mm -hmm. but also with the the time that you've had to have those conversations my father you know I've had people come up to my father my father was their you know we had a coach for um, team many years. You've met my dad. Yeah, yep. um, big guy, big guy. <laughs> they've come to me and they've actually thanked me. Yeah. For and, and parents have actually come up to me and said, you know, I want to thank you, or your, you, because your dad, you know, did so much for my child. And yeah. it was kind of weird to kind of have that. But yeah. you start to realize just how much of an impact that coaching profession has on an individual. Well, that and I think that's the thing that I was talking about, like. I wish that people that have the financial situations, um, politicians, bankers, I wish they would see, because I'm sure they have kids, and they realize that their kids need stuff like this. I wish they would go and try to help out coaches, try to help out clubs that need it uh, in order to keep them helping out young kids because mm -hmm. that's something nobody does anymore right and that's something that, that's always been needed mm -hmm. like I said I, me growing up as a kid I'm so happy there was a place like Scott Mission mm -hmm. uh, Kiwanis Boys Club uh, you know the YMCA little things um, we always found a way to get in there and play sports and I mean I have about a handful maybe three four or five guys that I we we we've uh, kept in touch after a long time. We, you know, reconnected, and you know they're doing well. And we all grew up in the same area, same environment. You know, we we talk about the people that have not here anymore because of whatever reasons. But mm -hmm. you know, we came out and we did well in in life. Um, and we always say, you know, I think what kept us in a good straight line was that we played sports. Mm -hmm. we res we had respect for our elders um, and we always found a way to make a positive where we were because you know we grew up in the projects I was the projects yeah but that was our home 
mm-hmm. and we were happy there, right? Um, we took care of each other, and it's nice to see now that as we get older, we get to enjoy reminiscing the old times, right? Mm-hmm. And I look at all these young kids now in, the, in my gym, sometimes I go, Pff, I wouldn't trade it in back. <laughs> I did not want to go through being 14, 15 again, and <laughs> you know, and all the tough things are going to come, like, you know, a man like yourself, myself, you know, it's, it's never been easy. Mm-hmm. It's always going to be a tough, it's always going to be a challenge. And I think that's what boxing always gave me was that it was never easy. You know, you're always finding a challenge in that gym. There's always a guy a little faster than you, a little stronger than you, a little more slick than you. And you have to find a way how to neutralize that. So how do you do that? You got to put that extra work. You got to ask for help. And you have to use your head to think. It's not about, let's see who's tougher. Let's go in the ring, let's see who's tougher. No. You, it's usually a smart guy that knows how to deal with that. Mm-hmm. It's not a guy that's like a, a caveman. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, yes, there are those guys, 100%. But they don't have that longevity that a smart guy will have. I look at somebody like Sugar Ray Leonard, you know, even Oscar De La Hoya. They still speak very clearly. They, have, they don't seem to have any damage done from the sport. Uh, Mayweather, you know, these guys are all set for life with money. They've uh, took it to the next level. And that's what I said. Like, I think this sport always gave me that. They always gave me that discipline and that challenge. And I think that's what kids need nowadays. They need something to help them with that. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's what they're lacking. I mean, most parents, they don't do that. They just kind of like, here, here's a video tape, go watch it. Yeah. I see that all the time. Yeah. Just let the kids go watch TV. You know, play stream game. something, watch it, hear some video games, sit in front of this. And then the other thing, too, that goes into that is, well, you, you, you know these parents are setting a, an example for them by being on their phones as well and, you know, yeah. and ignoring them. You know, um, yeah. being a role model is so, so important. It and, is. And, you know, giving them those lessons. And, yeah. and, and what you're doing, you're talking about sports, is... You're preparing them for life because the lessons that you learn in the sport, whether it's wrestling or boxing, um, you know, there's going to be roadblocks, whether it's I'm getting beat right now and I've got to change my trajectory of my skill set. I've got to, instead of a double leg, I got to, I got to do upper body motions or instead of a jab, I got to throw something else. I got to, you know, I've I've got to maneuver. And in life, it's the same thing, the same lessons. Like if you're being thrown a curveball in life, do you go head on through it? No. You usually find the path of least resistance. And when you're in sports, I think what sports does for you is it actually teaches you to find, you know, to find other avenues to pursue that will help you achieve your goals. Because sports are, for the most part, are goal oriented. You accomplish goals. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's incremental goals that you, you accomplish. And I, th- I think it also helps you with um, social skills. It's a huge thing for us. Yeah. Um, a lot of kids are not taught that from the beginning um mm-hmm. i have a kid um you know he when he came to me um a lot of trouble mm-hmm. oakville you know like and it's really weird like people hear oakville like <laughs> yeah but oh my god it's not jane are, fitch these kids are trying so hard to live up to that image though they're mm-hmm. trying so hard and um you know when i first got on my I, I had to sit down and i I got to know a little bit of the background, what's going on. Mm-hmm. And he got humbled in the gym very quick. Because as tough as he thought he was, all of a sudden, he's looking at me going like, oh my God, coach, this guy's so strong. I go, he's young. Yep. Right? And, um, you know, moving forward, he can't, I remember him coming to me at the gym at 17 years old. He goes, coach, I really want to compete. I want to learn, you know? And I said to him, are you ready? Are you ready to commit and put that work in that you need to? One hundred percent, coach. I go. I'm gonna tell you this because I told everybody that's competed for me. If you mess up, you're out. Mm-hmm. I go. I need you to give me a hundred percent because I knew this kid was in trouble. Um, he was in trouble with the law. He's in trouble like big time. And um, I, you know, I kept talking to him. You know, I, I've been there. I've been there. Um, I think the problem is in, in this society, a lot of people just judge you. Mm-hmm. 
they don't know really what's going on, but they judge you and then they, they hear something and then they water it down. It's a huge different story. You know, so I used to talk to this young man. I say, well, what is this going on? Well, you know, and he tell me why he got angry, why he did this, why he did that. And I said, okay, well, how'd, how'd, that, how'd that go for you? Oh, not good, you know, now I'm in trouble, this, this, that, right? Mm -hmm. So I said to him, you know, we're talking and talk to his people that take care of him and, um, you know, he, he, he got himself cleaned up nice, you know, like got rid of the trouble. Um, I kept talking about getting a job, you know, he got a job, he's so happy. I kept talking to him about, okay, you know, you're taking the bus from Ophi all the time, you know, now that you're working, maybe find yourself a little car, something that can get you here. Got a car, and now he's driving, he's happy, he's such a happy young man. Mm -hmm. He's he was mostly undefeated for most of the year. Last one about very close decision, but the young man has like turned his life around. But if I didn't give him that time and that structure, he wouldn't be here. Because nowadays these kids are just shooting each other everywhere. And with certain cultures, they're very explosive. So you have to learn how to defuse that. And touching on what you were saying, with my sport that's what it gave me it gave me that structure and I always talk to this kid the same way I say hey you know what happens if you don't sleep properly I'm gonna be so tired coach I know what happens if you don't eat properly well, I'm not gonna be I'm gonna be weak so if you don't sleep properly you can't perform properly if you don't eat properly you can't perform properly right so no discipline nothing comes good out of it I go, what do you think is going to happen in life? What if you can't get up at uh, 7 in the morning to go to work? You don't have the discipline to get up. What's going to happen? I'm going to lose my job, coach. Okay, now you can't have your car and you can't buy anything, right? Right. If you stay up all night and you can't get up in the morning, it's because you haven't slept properly. Your health is going to suffer too, right? You're right, coach. I go, okay. So I, I try to put it in ways that he can understand why I want him to do certain things and I think that's that's where I think a lot of parents are failing they're not giving them the examples that they need to hear as to why they need to go to sleep early as to why they gotta eat properly because they're not preparing them for the real life like hey you know if these kids get a job they gotta sleep properly because they gotta get up if they're not eating properly it's gonna suffer one way or the other so I think those are the things that I've I took from my personal experience and I give to these kids and it, it's helped out a lot and um, it's something that I think I'm always going to like be hard on kids about proper sleep proper eating give them that discipline you know that structure because I think that's what they need to begin with and like hopefully one day they can look back and go you know okay I was put on that structure by coach for a reason now I'm here you know what I mean and I have a lot of guys that have done that when you know they have their own kids and they bring their kids there, and they say, that's my coach. My coach is the one that got me here, and, you know, this is why I am who I am. And I watch the kids, you know, and the kids look at their dads, look at me, and they're like, did you used to beat up my daddy? <laughs> like, no, no. I say, I, I was tough on him, but he goes, you know, I put him where he is today because I wanted him to be a good man. Mm -hmm. And you, you see that a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it, it's a never-ending job, like a parent. It's a, it's a job that you're good at. <laughs> it's a job that many people are thankful for. Yeah. Raf, I want to thank you for coming on the show, man. Thank uh, you, it's sir. always a pleasure, and I'm sure we could talk for another hour, <laughs> but I know you've got things to do. I do, sir. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we haven't seen each other in so long. Let's do this again sometime. 100%. And talk a little bit more. Um, Especially, uh, I mean, I've found some things out about you I didn't know, um, and I'm sure our listeners are going to be on the edge of their seats, um, you know, listening to some of the stuff that you're telling us today. Great life lessons. Sports are so important. And the other thing, too, is what I want, uh, maybe from this podcast, maybe we can get, uh, if you want to give a, a shout-out to your gym, a shout-out to your, uh, your social media, if you want, so that anybody that wants to support your gym and yes. support your program and what you're doing uh, can get a hold of you. Great. I, I mean, um, my gym is um, Delgado Boxing. It's in Mississauga, 450 Matheson Boulevard East, Unit 44. Um, we have a boxing program, we have a karate, we have a little Muay Thai, but for the most part, we have a great gym with a family atmosphere. 
and that's what, what most, pe- most people are looking for. So hopefully one day I get more people coming through. You know what? I'm going to try and try and, and, and get more people coming out. I know <laughs> I've sent a couple of people your way. Yes. Uh, but uh, we'll get back on here. We'll do it. And, I'll, uh, of course, do you have any social media stuff? I know that... Uh, I'm mostly on Instagram. That's Instagram. All. What's, Instagram. Your, what's your... Um, uh, Raf- Rafael Delgado. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we'll get you tagged on Instagram and... Uh, we'll send more people your way and if Beautiful. we can get anybody some big donors out there that's got some support and wants to <laughs> put a program together there you go because uh, there are people out there that want to support stuff like that but thank you so much for coming by thank man. you sir appreciate yeah. you so much All right. thank you